What's going on everyone? Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to be doing a little something different. Instead of building something in Xcode, we're going to be tackling a Google interview question for iOS developers in Swift. I've got the question opened up on the left here and a playground on the right, and we're going to solve it together and reason about all the edge cases together as well. So if that sounds like a plan, start by dropping a like down below and let's jump right into the question. So I'm just gonna read it and then we're gonna to try to interpret this question together. So given an integer num rows, return the first num rows of Pascal's triangle. In Pascal's triangle, each number is the sum of the two numbers directly above it as shown. So it's nice they tell us what Pascal's triangle is because I don't know about you guys, but I have no idea what that is. So it looks like from the looks of this, we have one and then two more ones. And then hmm, we get a two here, which implies that it was two of these added and su summed to basically get two. The three in row four is one plus two, so that makes sense. So it looks like the middle numbers here are being computed by just adding the two things above it. So before diving into this, traditionally, you know, in an interview, it's good to probably clarify a couple of things that I would clarify, such as can number of rows that are given to us, the integer, can it be negative? Is that valid? Um, it tells us explicitly it's an integer, which is good. We can ignore things like doubles and floats and otherwise decimals. And with that, let's get into at least defining our function that's going to solve this problem. So I'm going to be creative and call it solve. It's going to take in num rows, which is an integer. And what we want to return is a... Uh, is a array which is going to be a nested array where each inner array rep represents a row, more or less. That was a bit of a tongue twister. In other words, the first array in this outer array, the first nested array, is going to be the first row, the next element will be the second row, so on and so forth. Now, before we get into this, let's go ahead and write out that edge case. So we're gonna say guard that num rows is greater than zero. Otherwise, we can simply return an empty array. And in fact, if num rows is equal to one, we probably don't even need to do any calculation because we know that the first row here is simply a one. So we can return a structure like this and just end it there. Now here we get to the interesting part where we need to figure out what this uh, result is going to be based on if num rows is obviously greater than 1. So we're going to go ahead and at least create a result array, which is what we're going to append stuff into and return it at the very bottom. Easy enough to get started. And if we take a step back and just look at this triangle, one thing, rather two things, pop out to me at least. The first thing is the first row we always know. It's the top of the triangle or the pyramid and it's only a one. So we can probably just append that right from the get-go, right from the beginning. We don't need to even check. Now the other thing which is glaringly obvious is the left and the right kind of edges of this pyramid or the sides are all ones. Um, excluding the base of course, but on this left side we have all ones and on the right side all ones. So when we compute any of the preceding rows as we go kind of top down, we only really need to be adding stuff to the middle elements. And as we go down in uh, the number of rows, like once we get to row number five, we have to add to three numbers, the four, the six, and the four. And you can imagine if you get to something like row 30, it's going to be 30, minus two because of the beginning one and the ending one and you'll do all your addition in there. So with those two observations made, how can we approach this? Well, the first thing we can do in our results array is we can append a single array with just a one and that takes care of our very tippy top of the pyramid looking good. The next part, what we probably wanna do is some type of for loop because we can't really obviously brute force append uh, just one by one because that won't work and we need a loop over the number of elements that is passed in so num rows So we're gonna go ahead and say for x in one up until num rows go ahead and do something Now why did I put one here? Well, we're gonna be appending to our results Every single time we compute a new row in here and we already have that first row Which is that element zero index zero, so we don't want to accidentally overwrite it so we're going to say x is going to start at 1. Now, 
we're going to create a new row and this new row is just going to start off with a one now every time we create a new row per the way this triangle looks the left side the leftmost element is going to be a one the next thing that we want to do inside of here is get the previous row now why do we want to get the previous row why do we care about it well it looks like, let's take row 3 as the example here, this 2 is the summation of 1 and 1, which is right above it. So we want to get the previous row so we can get elements from it to add up to compute the elements in our new row. Now that's also why we started at 1, because if we started at 0 and tried to get you know, the row prior, we would crash because negative 1 is not a valid index. So let's get previous row, and this is going to be from our results, it's going to be x minus 1, where x represents the current row that we're basically putting together. Now let's see what else we want to do. The next thing that we really want to do is another for loop in here where we can loop through the elements in the previous row and add everything together and append it to our new row. So our new row already has a 1 in it, so that looks good. So let's go ahead and do another loop. So we're going to say for j in 0, all the way to previous row dot counts, we want to go ahead and do something. Now that something is rather simple actually. What we want to do is to our new row, we actually want to append from the previous row the element at j, and we want to append from the previous row the element at j, and let's see, we can do j plus 1, which will be the thing right next to it. But rather, let's do j minus 1. And let me actually start iterating from 1. And then let me clean up this code a little bit so we can see it a little better. So we're going to make this sum, and I'll throw sum here. Now, bear with me while I explain why we started at 1 here. Um, it'll be much more clear once we get to running this code uh, with an example. But this is going to basically compute our middle numbers, right? So for example, this 2, we're going to start off uh, with this 1, since j will be 1 to start off with. And we're going to say add this and the prior thing to j, which will be this. So 1 plus 1 will give us 2. Similar for this 3 in row number 4, we're going to say add the 2 and the prior thing, which will be 1, which will give us 3. Similar, you can apply that to all of the other rows, and it will give you the proper sum. Now we're not quite done yet. Uh, there are two big things that we actually have not done. One is once we've created this current row or this new row, we never actually stuck it into our results. So we don't want to forget to do that. And we also need to stick a trailing one in our new row because each row ends with a one. So it started with a one, so we explicitly created it with a starting one and it ended with a one. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that is it. We're getting yelled at because I should have a bracket there for our closed range for our inner for loop, and we should be good to go. Now, what other optimizations can we make before we test our actual solution by running it through a function call? Uh, the one tiny optimization that comes to mind is when we create this results array here, we can actually explicitly say how much capacity this result should have because we know how many sub arrays we'll be creating. So we can actually say result reserve capacity num rows and this will constrain this results array to exactly the size that we need it to be, not one slot more, not one slot less. Now that's something good to call out. It's a very nitty gritty optimization, but nevertheless good to know. So with that said, let's go ahead and actually run this and print out our results, and let's see what we get. So we're going to say our answer, let's see if we can spell it correctly, is going to be solve, and we're going to print out the first three rows of Pascal's triangle. Now this is going to be a little hard to visualize, so I'm going to go ahead and say row in answer, go ahead and print out said row. Let's go ahead and give it a run, and hopefully we should see our output in the bottom here. We'll go ahead and pause and play again. Sometimes, there we are. Sometimes my uh, my playground here does not cooperate. So we have the first row as a one, we have two ones and a one, two, one. So it looks like that definitely matches our triangle figure here. Let me also go ahead and add some line breaks because there's this weird output that Xcode has given me at the bottom. And let's go ahead and make this, um, let's make this the first 10 rows of Pascal's triangle and let's see how we did. All right, there we are. So we see the one, one, 
the two ones, and then the one, two, one, the three, the four, six, four. So we're all the way good until the bottom of this figure on the left. And let's manually figure out the next one. So then we get five, 10, 10, and five. So the five we get because basically we have the four plus one, the 10 we get because six plus four, this 10 also four plus six, this five because we have one plus four, and we can probably do the same uh, basic arithmetic all the way down until we get to the very bottom here. So it does in fact work, and it's not as scary as the problem might seem at first glance. Now before we wrap up here, a really critical part, runtime complexity and space time, let's see what it is. So for your time complexity, the fact that you have two nested for loops should be a dead giveaway that it's probably n squared. There's no recursive call here. We're not dividing by a middle pivot point, which would lead to something like n log or optimization like that. So the time complexity here is order of, or O of, let's see if I can write this out, O of n squared. So that makes sense. Now, one thing that's good to know is what is n here? n is going to be where n is num rows that we are passing in. So this is the time complexity. Now, what is the space complexity? The space complexity will actually be the exact same thing. And why might that be? Because we are iterating through every single row for every single number of rows that we need and we are creating the structure that we want to return. Now, we're not exactly using a auxiliary structure per se to keep track of anything. We're kind of just creating it in our result and returning it. But nevertheless, n squared um, is generally what would be the acceptable answer here. And that's it. That is Pascal's triangle for you in a nutshell. A pretty popular interview question, definitely asked by Google, definitely asked by Meta, other large top tech companies. If you have any questions about this question, no pun intended, definitely leave a comment down below. I plan to do many more interview question type videos on this channel. Also working on some of that iOS interview prep content that I've been uh, procrastinating about for many, many months now. So stay tuned for that. That all said, subscribe if you haven't done so already. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.